Hi guys, my name is Farhan, and uh, this is something that I've been working on for some time now. Uh, this is the first time I'm talking about it anywhere at all. Uh, it's very much a work in progress. And uh, how many of you are programmers here? You can just can I have another raise of hand? All right, fine, fair, fair enough. So um, this is more uh, of something which you know probably should have been spoken out spoken out at FOSS or something like that. Uh, I was told that this is going to be primarily a technical audience. So um, hence, I'm just, you know, this is a work in progress, but hopefully you'll like what's being shown here. Um, I have uh, my original background is uh, an analog electronics. Uh, that's what I do uh, best. But um, I'm also fairly conversant in C language. Um, and that these two things apart, Last 10 years, we've been running a place called Lamakan, which is a critical public open space for liberal politics and culture as well. So it's a mishmash of a lot of things happening here. But essentially, uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about here uh, is actually something which we have borrowed directly from the military, from the, from the defense electronics. Uh, so, uh, in, in, in the defense world, there is uh, a concept called uh, MANET. I don't know if, many, if any of you have heard of it. So, MANET means Mobile Ad Hoc Network. And the idea of a Mobile Ad Hoc Network uh, is firstly, it's mobile. So, uh, it's something that you carry with you like a cell phone or whatever or a man pack. Usually, they were man packs back in the 70s, uh, but they've reduced the size considerably. Uh, and as it happens with defense, that there are a lot of security implications. Uh, you should not be able to intercept it. You should not be able to block it. Uh, it should be reliable. It should last a long time. It should have a very long range. I mean, all the things that you can think of are there in the Manet. So uh, my project is actually called FreeMan. It's a free mobile ad hoc network, uh, which is meant for um, challenging atmospheres and environments. Um, and by challenging, I mean that um, they can be deployed where there is a natural disaster or a man-made disaster or the internet is down or the, you know, I mean, a war situation in times of peace everywhere. But it's of particular interest to where the internet is down and I will tell you why that is. But just before we get there, a couple of uh, points that I wanted to make. Uh, one is that um, after 1857s, uh, revolution, the British decided that it was very important that the communication lines across the subcontinent were, you know, strengthened. So what they did is that they actually put together uh, the telegraph network of India, right? And the 1882 Telegraph Act also came in as a result of that. And if you imagine that there were just 6,000 of uh, white, mostly men, who ran the country, and uh, they ran it on these couple of telegraph lines. And the telegraph lines are at best about 10 bits per second, right? And they managed to control us all. So that actually shows you the amplifying power, the multiplication factor that communication networks bring into subjugating somebody or into freeing yourself up. And what has increasingly happened is, uh, this is something that you know I was discussing with Kiran also just a little while ago that we do not imagine how much of bandwidth we require. Actually, we require far less bandwidth than we consume now, right? And we do that because uh, most of the bandwidth is, you know, pictures of kittens, you know, videos, uh, advertisements, actually, large part of it, porn. I mean, this, you can just name it. But if you look at, for example, the entire uh, Wikipedia, I can still, the text of it, fit into a single SD card, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the amount of internet that you actually require, the data connection that you require for tactical information, tactical information, okay, the word is tactical. That is, you know, saying I'm going here, where are you, I'm here, where are, I mean, you know, uh, for instance, to denote the position where, I mean, that I'm standing here, I can do it in about eight bytes, accuracy to the probably one meter, anywhere on the globe, right? I, have, I can compress that into, 
uh, a single 64-bit integer. So uh, the amount of, uh, I mean, th that's the location update, right? You just require eight bytes of information to give a very accurate uh, uh, coordinate. So uh, the amount of information that you actually require is far less than we assume it to be. Uh, and I'll, I'll actually discuss that a little while, you know, and I'll show you what technology is being used by the armies across the world. I'll just give you one example, right? So you look at this, uh, this uh, radio, it's called the Rifleman Radio, okay? NATO uses it. Uh, you guys must have heard of the Star Wars program, right? Uh, Ronald Reagan, I mean, people who were born around that time, you know, most of this hall doesn't seem to have been born by, by then, but... So, um, this is used by soldiers, right? Constantly keeps you in touch with your... This is, by the way, from a brochure of Rifleman. Uh, keeps you in touch with your entire platoon, the platoon leader, voice and position information. So it's, you know, the entire team is sort of sharing that. Leader gets to see where all your soldiers are. So actually, the many of them have this heads-up display, right? Uh, like the Google Glass which was actually inspired by them. And you can actually see who's where, you know, who's behind you, who's in front of you. So basically, in front of you, there's a virtual ring that you see. And there's a 12 o'clock position, which is ahead of you and 6 o'clock behind you. And around the ring, your teammates are spotted. So when you turn around here, the ring also rotates, you know, in front of your eye. Uh, then uh, it's completely encrypted. So basically, there is you can do secure communications and unsecure communications on that. Um, and uh, what happens is that the frequency of this radio keeps fluttering about all the time, right? So it's never, you know, at one frequency. So if one frequency gets jammed, you move on to another frequency, et cetera, et cetera. And the way it works is that you basically use a pseudo random number generator, right? A pseudo random number generator basically generates a series of random numbers, but they're not random. Given the initial number, there's a particular sequence that it does. And you use these to call various channels out at various points in time so that both the receiver and the transmitter keep jumping in the frequency simultaneously so that others can't jump around at the same time. Then they use encryption. Uh, encryption is already available for us civilians, right? We have the SSL3, et cetera, et cetera. They use AES25. Now, uh, you see this? Put a soldier on the radio in the mountain and he'll act as a bridge between other soldiers, etc. So, you know, they, they can relay from each other. And you must have seen the dramatic use of this, for example, when they took out Osama bin Laden, that people rushed in and from there to the helicopter, from the helicopter to a flying drone, from flying drone to a satellite, all the way through a you know inter-satellite link to White House and, you know, there's Obama, uh, Osama, okay, killing of Obama, you know, something, something, is all very fairly dramatic stuff. But the most dramatic thing here is the radio itself by General Dynamics, you can't buy it. Only the governments can buy it, right? And uh, if you were a government, it would still cost you about 50 lakh rupees. That's the cost of this radio. Now, I can't imagine what would go into this for it to actually cost $100,000, right? $100,000 is what it costs. The Indian government has bought 6,000 of these at a low rate of 3,000 crores. The order has just gone out. So, uh, but the point is, if you look at each of these technologies uh, individually, they are doable, right? They're completely doable. And uh, this is the sort of stuff that there is no reason why citizens should not have. That, that citizens should be able to communicate with each other without relying on infrastructure whether it's internet or whatever, should be able to share or communicate very pertinent, life-saving bits of information and their own personal status, whatever, you know, alive, dead, I'm here, you know, I've been caught, whatever, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, you know, coordinate with each other. I think it's, that should be a fundamental right, you know, given that the technology is here and it should be encrypted. Nobody else should be able to interfere with you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, everything that is about the rifle man should be available with free man as well. So this is the whole idea, that we have a mo an open source mobile ad hoc network, okay? And we do precisely and exactly the same thing that 
the army does but we replicate in exactly the same communication system on our own it should be able to do voice it should be able to do messaging it should be able to do automatic position reporting system which is you know as you're moving around it should be able to report your position direct links that is from point to point there should be no need for any base station wifi router nothing etc you should be able to have at least a range of 10 kilometers here and direct link and then uh, you should be able to evolve it you should be able to augment it for example you can add a gps to show your position you should be able to you know pick sensors up you should be able to you know add all sorts of devices to it and extensibles because it's open and you can hack it etc and the most important thing is that from uh, 10 million rupees you should be able to do it for less than 1000 rupees i think all these are possible and this is what this project is about so um, in order to do this uh, these are the three fields which have to merge together and i need people who will collaborate with us on this so the free uh, the free man uses codex to compress voice it's completely based on arduino okay and the reason why it's based on arduino is that a raspberry pi can be compromised because it's got an operating system right you can root it you can never root an arduino because it doesn't have an operating system so you might have left it somewhere and somebody would have you know planted a backdoor onto it etc etc with an arduino that's not possible because an 8 bit processor doesn't have an operating system and your entire source code is with you you can actually flash it from your uh, computer by yourself without you know relying on anybody else's help so you know that it's completely secure uh so what happens is on one hand you need to know voice over ip codec etc i was actually part of the itf uh, work group which uh, standardized voice over ip um I've, i belong to the stone age of voice over ip before the standards were there in fact the precursor to sip protocol which is used for voip uh, we actually wrote the first reference implementation very few people know this it was actually written in india by us and everybody else interoperated off with us um you have to be able to do very very cutting edge stuff with arduino and i'll discuss that in a little while where you have to actually debug not with a debugger but but with an oscilloscope because this is where the analog meets the uh, digital you should know your radios well you should know your analog electronics well as well but all this has to because you know it has to be product productizable at the end of the day the magic is in the software not in the hardware the hardware is actually pretty simple Uh, this is what it looks like <clears throat> so that's the hardware and uh, it can do voice and if you see here i've connected it through the serial port of the arduino to a simple uh, terminal emulator on the phone itself so you can use the phone as a user interface right now um i have problems even with that because the phone can be compromised right we saw what pegasus did so uh, it's best to actually instead of this have a terminal a hardware terminal itself written in a in something which is a little more elaborate than the arduino uh through which you can do messaging directly right and uh, this is like the old irc chat i mean you know this goose is sitting here he and i have been through the prehistory of internet on irc servers for a long time <clears throat> so um as you can see the hardware is pretty simple and the magic is in the software and i'll explain what it takes to get this thing going and where we are now so this is the maths we are using a lora module and uh, we have a spreading factor of 6 and a bandwidth of 500 kilohertz right so uh, 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 the spreading factor essentially is like this that lora does not work out one frequency but it has this chirps which chirp from one frequency to another so right and uh, the direction of the chirp says whether it's 0 or 1 and the spreading factor will tell you how many chirps make up one bit right so uh, that's the spreading factor and the bandwidth is 500 kilohertz so what happens is your chirp is 500 kilohertz wide when your chirp is 500 kilohertz wide you can't jam the signal anywhere because your jamming has to be 500 kilohertz wide for it to be effective and over it and above that you can also do you know frequency hopping which is also possible uh, with these lora modules uh, so uh, we actually uh have uh, gone up to 25 kilometers range actually on this <coughs> lora uh thing and 
Uh, with this setting of spreading factor six and 500 kilohertz uh, bandwidth, <coughs> we actually have, I'll, I'll, I can actually show, sort of demonstrate it to you here. The LoRa power output was eight plus 18 dBm, uh, dBm which will amount to about, uh, about 70 milliwatts, right? 70 milliwatts of power. And 10 kilometers path loss at 433 megahertz is uh, 105 dB. By the way, all, my entire presentation is this, right? I mean, they're all just my lab notes. Uh, so you'll just have to put up with fairly bad <laughs> PowerPoints. It's not a PowerPoint, it's just pictures from a notebook. Uh, so <clears throat> what happens is plus 18 dBm, path loss is minus uh, 105 dBm. So the receiver, the signal at the receiver is minus 87 dBm and the minimum discernible level is minus 111 dBm. Now, how do I know this? I know this because I measured it. So you take a LoRa module, you add an attenuator in the middle, and you connect it to a spectrum analyzer, and you keep going down until the signal is no longer receivable. So you know at what point it's going. So actually, this is all experimentally verified, right? So we've actually, it took us almost two months to get this entire math in place. Anyhow, but even with this 10 kilometers path loss, you still have a 24 dB link margin. That is, your signal can go down another 250 times before you lose the signal. So it's a fairly reliable even at uh, 10 kilometers. But the whole idea is that this margin of 24 dB can be simply lost if there is a wall or two or three walls in the middle, which is why the link margin has to be that much. So that's first part of the maths. The second part of the maths which is this, <clears throat> that uh, at that setting, we were able to get about 35 kilobits per second on LoRa, uh, which is too high. Uh, the human voice needs 8,000 samples per second for you to be able to listen to the human voice, right? Actually, four kilohertz bandwidth with an equest criterion, it comes to 4, 8,000 samples. And uh, the Arduino can give you 10 bits per sample, that is 80,000 bits per second which is far more than the 32 kbps uh, that you have here. So um, uh, we have to compress this down to 32 kilobits per second, right? So what we do is we use something called as an adaptive uh, pulse coding modulation. So what you do here is that you actually just transmit the difference between two samples instead of transmitting the value of each sample, and you digitally just keep adding up the differences and then make it back into the main waveform again at the other end. But even there, uh, what happens is that to save the number of bits, you actually, the step size, that is if you say, you know, go five up or three down, what, what is five? Five could be five into two, so you have a multiplier, which you are always using the steps to calculate the steps, the multiplier, that itself keeps moving which is why it's called adaptive differential pulse code modulation. It's not only differential, but the difference, uh, which is you know, uh, counted in the number of pulses is itself a dynamically varying thing. There's still a work in progress, as the demonstration will show you, the voice is not still very clear. Uh, but you know, this is the hard part, this is really the hard part. A codec usually takes a couple of years to stabilize. Um, I was uh, maintaining the ARM uh, port of Speaks codec, and uh, it took me about six months to stabilize it. Codecs are really hard to do because there is no objective criterion. The waveform which goes in and the waveform which comes out are completely different. So you can't you know, just take their pictures and compare them to each other. It's a human intell intelligibility which has to be done. It's like watching somebody's face and going and redrawing it somewhere else, right? Based on five variables. Say, you know, nose is big, eyes are short, you know, no hair. So you, if, if it's not the same person, then it's not the same person. So, uh, voice coding is very difficult, which is why I've said that's still work in progress. And this is actually as simple as the hardware gets, which is you have an Arduino, uh, and you have these two amplifiers, the LM386, they are the most commonly used audio amplifiers among hackers and makers, etc. They cost about 10 rupees or 15 rupees each. <clears throat> and uh, you use one to amplify the mic to the point where it can be digitized by the Arduino. And uh, what you do for the output is that there is no analog output on the Arduino, right? So what you do is you take one pin and you make it go up and down. And uh, the up to down cycle you 
control in such a way that the average works out to anywhere between 0 and 5 volts. I mean, if it's on all the time, it's 5 volts. If it's off all the time, it's 0 volts. If it is on for half the time and off for half the time, it's 2.5 volts average. So what you do is you basically charge this capacitor through a resistor and it keeps going up and down like this here. That's here, but here you get a, you get a waveform being produced by that. So, um, and we're using an Arduino because Arduino costs only 200 rupees to buy, right? 150 rupees actually. So this is the entire circuit diagram of what we have to put together. Uh, most of this stuff is actually available in Chandni Chowk, right? And you can buy this entire stuff for 500 rupees <clears throat> and put this thing entire together. The Arduino is about 200 rupees. Uh, the LoRa module is another 200 rupees and 50 rupees each for one of these, I mean, two of these audio amplifiers and you're done. So now the thing is that the Arduino has only two kilobytes of RAM. We are not talking of two megabytes or gigabytes, but 2000 bytes, that's all. Uh, can I get some water please? <clears throat> right? Uh, so uh, what we have to do is, uh, as the audio is coming in, now the, the key thing about implementing VoIP in such a small footprint is that from the mic, you are 8,000 times digitizing something, right? And you have to keep compressing it and keep shutting it out as well, right? On the other hand, there's stuff coming in from the radio, which you need to keep playing back to the speaker as well. So you're at least doing four or five things at once. And there's no multitasking because there's no operating system. And this is not uh, even a 16-bit processor, it's an 8-bit processor. The processor uh, that you know went out of fashion in the 1970s, but you are stuck with it. So um, uh, what you have to and and there is no memory also. So uh, the total memory is 2,000 bytes, and you are getting 8,000 samples per second. So you can't even hold them with you, right? So what you have to do is one packet of sound has to go out almost every 50 milliseconds, right? Less than 50 milliseconds, every 25 milliseconds. You should finish up with whatever you have. So 25 milliseconds is 200 samples. 200 samples have to be shipped out before you can make space to get any more in. So uh, what you do is you implement this thing called a circular buffer, right? Where as the packets are coming in, as, a, as the samples are coming in, they're just being written into some memory locations which wraps around and there's another pointer so they are being written by the head and the tail keeps picking them back again. So there are two pointers which are sort of dog chasing its own tail all around it. And you just keep picking these up. Uh, and you, do, you cannot wait for long. So you basically keep shutting things out. You do this both on receive as well as transmit, right? And you only have 16 megahertz of CPU speed. It's not in gigahertz, it's in megahertz, right? 16, 000, uh, 16 million um, instructions per second and eight bits. <coughs> Uh, now about uh, jamming, so here we use a combination of analog and digital techniques. Now the analog technique is very simple. Somebody jams you on one frequency, you just go off to another frequency, you just dial out another frequency, right? So that's actually a simple thing to do. Or you say that, you know, let's meet on so and so frequency, this is what we hams do. You always get on a particular frequency. But what happens here is, that these frequencies are spread out so huge that it's impossible for anyone to jam. Uh, let me just see if I have a picture of that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come to it. The pictures probably, you know, have dropped it somewhere. The other thing that you could also do with the LoRa module is you can actually do frequency hopping. That is, you can actually rapidly change frequency from one packet to another, that is you transmit one on frequency A, you go to frequency X for the second, come back to frequency J, then frequency K, etc. But to do that, both the sides have to, you know, uh, jump in sync, right? So how do you sync that up is a question. And the way you do that is actually by syncing the clocks of both the sides together. And one very simple way of doing it is to use GPS module, not for positioning, but to get your clock right because the GPS also transmits a clock signal, 
which is the one of the most accurate clock uh, signals possible in the world because it's based on cesium clocks which are flying on the satellites so you just take that and sync the clocks on both the freeman radios that you have and then you can keep jumping in sync and others will not be able to intercept you so if you do that that's another 400 rupees a gps if you would like to do the gps disciplining okay then we come to encryption so the 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 uncrackable uh, encryption is not public private key encryption but but private key encryption that is you know both of us have one secret we say okay now we'd like to speak secretly and then uh, both of us key in the same uh, key on both ends and everything is encrypted right now for that AES is actually the most powerful encryption system. It uses 256 bits, uh, but this is too expensive for the Arduino. And I will talk about what to do when you run out of speed on the Arduino. Uh, one way is to offload this to a Raspberry Pi or a PC. That is, you use this Freeman only as a modem connected to a PC and do the encryption on the PC. But the PC itself can be Uh, compromise that can be key loggers then there can be you know uh, things which are in the background monitoring your speaker and mic etc so it, it's a little difficult to do that des was the defense uh, department of defense us encryption standard for a very long time uh, but it's no longer secure what happens with most of these encryption things is that you make uh, it so difficult to try out various combinations that you sort of lose track Uh, i mean you cannot do it in real time it might take you months to actually find out what the message was by trying out various keys if you remember the movie on alan turing there are this ma these machines which keep on trying various things right so what happens is you come out with an encryption standard and after a couple of years the computers become so powerful that they can crack it then you do something more complex so uh, this is uh, crackable uh, not crackable by people in india but you know freeman is supposed to be universally applicable solution so we are not talking about indian context here at all or freeman could even be used by the indian defense forces in which case you know they have to fight with others who have you know chinese and all that who have uh, more you know computing power at their resource one option here is this now what happens is that most of the time we choose passwords which are based on your nephew's name or your girlfriend's name etc i mean this is what we do right uh, so they are guessable because most of the time they are text and if they are text then you are just limited to 26 letters uh, that's why you know you say please in, in, you know include a punctuation mark and this and that etc but even then they are actually guessable so what you do is you take this password and take an md5 checksum which is a 40 bit thing so whatever your password is even if it's say hello 1 2 3 you put it into that then you get an md5 thing you use that as a password or, or you use that as a key right on to something called an rc4 this is still a work in progress um, i have not managed to you know rewrite it in assembly because it has to work in real time on the arduino while it is doing the encryption uh, coding decoding etc and all the others are going on but this is where some help is required the other way is to move to a more powerful embedded controller so there's something called blue pill i don't know how many of you have heard of it but blue pill is like arduino but it it runs on an arm processor which is a 32 bit processor it costs about the same uh, but the problem uh, with blue pill and teen c are firstly they are costly which is not such a big deal but the more important thing is that they are not universally available the whole idea is to put a solution together that in any city in the world you should be able to go to a hobby electronic market buy the stuff put it together and you have something working right that's the whole thing that it should be viral it should be hackable that everybody should have access to this stuff so this is the status now <laughs> the the communication core has been done uh, we managed to get about almost 4800 bytes per second out of this we have already created the first uh, noise on wipe that is you know i can completely make out what the other person is saying so you you know i mean what happens is when we talk about um uh, telephony we are used to uh, certain levels of service right and these levels of service are always changing for example with 4g our voice is much more clearer than it used to be earlier and if you if you remember 
the AM radio, especially, I don't know how many of you listen to Binaka Geetmala and Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation. It was far worse, right? But um, in times of emergency, you can afford to relax the quality of the voice as long as you can communicate intelligibly, right? So that's the whole idea that uh, we should be doing that. We have done range tests. It actually goes up to 25 kilometers. So the way we did it is we actually flew uh, one of these on a party balloon, right? Because it's very small. So you put it with the mercury uh, thing and you know with the GPS you fly it out so you know where it has gone. And uh, so it's actually gone far more than 25 kilometers, but 25 kilometers clear range. And the user interface has to be done. So, you know, we need to still do some parts of it. Now, the whole idea is usually putting up a TFT screen, a QRT keyboard will make it extremely expensive. One way is to pair it with a, uh, pair it with a phone like I've done here. And the other way is, of course, uh, to build something, you know, which can input text because you have to be able to input at least your encryption key you have to be able to, you know, input your um, uh, text messages, uh, somebody else's name, be able to chat with it, right? So either use a T9, in which case you can save the number of keys or go for 40 keys as push buttons or something like that. But all that makes it a little difficult to assemble, right? As opposed to pairing it with, with a phone or with a laptop, in which case you can, you know, work well and everybody has a phone. But the whole idea is it's not guaranteed to be secure. You don't know what the phone is doing, which is why it's you know important to do that. So um, this uh, I have already pushed onto the GitHub. So if you can go to github.com, actually I forgot to write that, A Farhan, uh, you can actually uh, download the circuit diagram and the software. The software is very badly written right now. It's not refactored and made smooth and very readable because I've been hacking at it you know, all the time. But this is the latest snapshot which is there. So it's actually github slash afaran slash freeman. That is the uh, earl there. Uh, and you know that's how you contact me. That's my email address. Um, I, one of the businesses that we run is called hfsignals.com, uh, which is an open source analog radios. And uh, there is also exceed.com. We have uh, built two uh, space missions till now. One was launched by SpaceX, the other by ISRO. Uh, we are the first private space company as well. So there, you know, we have actually a, a CubeSat up in space, which can digipeat, meaning it, it's a digital repeater of packets uh, of data, which it can repeat, but they are short packets, <coughs> 70 bytes, and they can be paired with any walkie-talkie. But, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a good solution on paper, but you should be able to track the satellite. The satellite is available only for 20 minutes in a day. You should know where it is. You know, you should be able to point the... See, what happens is in most of these solutions that we propose, we do not look at how practical the solution is. For example, there's a solution saying you can do Wi-Fi range. It'll go to 10 kilometers. You take a Pringle scan, and in that you put a, an antenna, and, you know, it, it does... But it's actually impractical because both the Pringle cans, which are 10 kilometers away, have to point to each other within about one degree accuracy. So even a little bit of wind can shake it off, you know, if it's raining, the thing goes away, etc. So you need something which is reliable, which works on, you know, whip antennas or a piece of wire. Uh, it just works, right? It should have no problems in working at all. So uh, that's actually what we're trying to do here. I can take questions if you have, and then we'll try seeing if this thing works. Okay, uh, I'm going to limit it to two questions. We are running short on time, but Farhan is here. Uh, you should talk to him post this as well. So, so two questions. Okay. You should ask if you're slow enough. Uh, somewhat a little tangential. Uh, there are hardware encryption chip, chips, right? Uh, is that too complex? They're very expensive. Where do you get hold of them? Yeah, that's what, that's the whole idea. The whole idea is this: you should be able to, you know, put it together on your kitchen table. And this question. Very interesting presentation, first of all. And you said the limit, the range was 25 kilometers when you flew a balloon. Yeah. But what happens when you're communicating on the ground? So because which is why 10 kilometers, right? So what happens is you are in the middle of uh, trees, etc. Now, the first thing is we are at 433 megahertz. Yes. 
so the trees and rain etc do not actually you know attenuate the signal as much right and uh, we still have a link margin of 24 db over that range right so i can actually increase the uh, because what happens is beyond a particular time the line of sight goes away meaning the curvature of earth comes into space and you know other stuff happen actually cities for 433 megahertz are actually better than let's say a forest because these waves will bounce off the buildings and you know get around right the buildings uh, are almost like mirror to 433 megahertz that's what's very wonderful about this frequency that it actually bounces off the buildings and it spreads all over so uh, the the but the range you know don't expect more than about 5 kilometers in an urban place right but there can be softer layer as you know if you are talking about it on top of it which can sort of repeat the message especially if it's encrypted then it doesn't matter who's repeating it right so you have a hop count saying okay it will repeat for five hops and then it will die off after that